and it's recording. Click on that again, and that should work now. Okay, one of my favorite subjects is eternal rewards. And uh, originally, this was probably called the Judgment Seat of Christ, but it's been renamed eternal rewards. So that way, it's not such a negative connotation. But that's what we're talking about: is the Judgment Seat of Christ and discussing how that changes us and affects us and why we do the things that we do. And this is a topic that's often neglected within the church. Unfortunately, it's not a common topic. This was a topic all throughout the church up until about 100 years ago. So about 115, 20 years ago, the church made a major shift and stopped focusing on things that were tough subjects like this because men were going back to work at um, factories and stuff like that. And so they were coming to churches often. And so the people coming to church were who? Yeah. Women and their children. So the pastors realized that they uh, were preaching to a different audience and that they started talking on more feeling type discussions, more of the women would show up. And so that's where you see the changing of the church from going away from talking about was typically known as like tougher and masculine type conversations to becoming more about feelings. It had a major effect on music, the way the which the church was decorated, and so forth. And that's why. The, I wonder if like granny style. Yes, that's why ch many churches are granny style. And so now you're seeing today a pushback on that. But unfortunately, I don't know if a lot of churches are talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And like I said, it's been neglected. So we are correcting that here. If we are forgiven of our sin, let's say you, you, you've sinned and, and you come to Christ and you accept Christ as your Savior. If you're forgiven of your sin, what is your motivation to make the right choices? What's your motivation to make the right choices if all your sins are forgiven? God happy. Okay, so to make God happy, that's that's one of the reasons, right? That's a good reason. That was the way you like worded that. I'm very confused. Well, you got a right answer. Okay. We make right decisions to make God happy. That's one of the reasons. That shouldn't be the sole reason. Here's a question. Uh, I don't know if you've had a good parent or not, or a good dad. So if you have, then great work with this. If you have it, make up one. If you had a parent and you, why would you listen to your parent? You respect them. What else? Because they're the boss. What happens if you don't listen to the boss? Consequences. Consequences. That's right. Now, do you also do it because you love them? Yeah. So there's a mixture there. Same thing is true with God. There's... God wants us to listen to him because we love him, but it's also a good motivator that when we know that the hand of knowledge is going to come back on the seat of understanding, that we make the right choice because we know there's consequences for when we mess up. Uh, what you give up in this life, you will be rewarded with and given back. And so that's not, doesn't mean it's going to be a direct correlation, meaning like you give up. Uh, some of your time and therefore in heaven you're going to get back some of your time but you will be rewarded in such a way that it is it's a reward for doing the right things you may not get fat food you just may get more rewards in heaven it may not be big fat food but that's a reward. yes it's a reward yes but just because you give up your steak just because you give up your steak to a homeless person here on Not earth, bad. does that mean when you go to heaven you're going to get a big fat steak waiting for you? I wish that was the case. Really? Uh, <laughs> I, don't know. I, I do think that there is a uh, steak tree in heaven, but that's just my theory. I haven't seen any biblical evidence for it, but it's got to be true. Or at least there needs to be a fruit. This guy could make a fruit taste like steak. So that's my thing. There is kale out there. A seaweed that does take like taste like bacon, so I know that's that's true. There's a seaweed out there that you could eat that tastes like bacon. No, I say it tastes just like bacon. I don't care. I'll try it out. 
So, where do you get it? You can't. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, privately, it was a group who figured it out and they have the market on there and they're trying to figure out how to market it. That might be so, a possible what is it? I don't know how they got, how they came up with the bacon. Kale, I think it was one of those flukes. They figured it out. I went, oh, this tastes just like bacon. And now they're trying to figure out how to market it. And, uh, I've been reading about it for the last couple of years, and there's been no movement because I keep waiting for it to come out. I will be the healthiest person in the world as soon as that comes out. <laughs> I will eat my uh, seaweed every day if it tastes like bacon. Uh, well, I don't care as long as it tastes good. Wait, when they do like in Japanese restaurants, when they make like. Um Oh, yeah, sushi thing? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, can you imagine sushi rolls where they take the seaweed and they wrap it up and wants to taste like bacon? There you go. Well, that's wrong, but that's okay. You're not allowed to like good things. So, um, I'm going to sneak in some of that seaweed when it becomes available. So, all right, moving on. Let's go ahead and look at number one. Oh, went too fast. Oh, the verses. First Corinthians 3. Uh, 5 through 15, it's going to take me a little bit. What then of Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who caused, causes the growth. Now he who plants... And he who waters are one. But each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So Paul's not getting the rewards off of Apollos. Paul's not getting rewards off of Paul. They're getting their own rewards based on what they chose to do themselves. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Again, this is personal now. Be careful how you build. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. So what you build in your life will become evident. If you make your stuff with things that is uh, hay and straw, which burn up and don't last, it's going to become evident. And it's going to be evident when you go to heaven and, you, and we're all saying the judgment seat of Christ. But if you build things with precious stones, then those are the things that are going to last. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. Again, it goes back to that idea. If it's hay and straw, what happens to hay and straw and fire? It goes poof. But the gold and the, and the precious gems, that will still be there. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which has been built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. So when we stand before God and we go through a testing and a trial of sense and he decides to find out what is fluff in your life and he burns off all the fluff, what is left that is good, that's what our rewards are going to be based on. If all our life is full of fluff and we've got ourselves two little diamonds, then guess what your reward is? Two little diamonds worth. But if you have stored up lost treasures in heaven, then you will have lots of rewards in heaven. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. So there are going to be people who are going to barely squeeze into heaven. In fact, I'm thinking of the thief on the cross who was with Jesus in paradise. But when he got into paradise, he was smelling like smoke when he arrived. Because he barely got in there. But he did. And it's better to be in heaven than it is to be in hell no matter what. Number one, there is a judgment coming from God for each one of us on the basis of how we have lived our life. There is a judgment coming from God for each one of us on the basis of how we have lived our life.
There are, we will be rewarded for what we do, for the things that we do that are right, and there'll be consequences for the things we do wrong. But what I like is, is God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. This is what you need to do in your life. You need to take care of the widows. You need to care for the for the poor. Uh, you know, you need to worship me. And when we do those things, God rewards us. But those are the things we're supposed to do. So that'd be like me telling my daughter, go clean up your room because it's a mess every day. Clean it up. And every time she cleaned it up, I rewarded her. Now, she's supposed to just clean her room because she lives in my house. That's just a requirement. So when I reward her, that's something above and beyond just living in my house. I'm not saying your room's a mess. Oh, is it clean right now? Yeah. Don't need to go into that then. When we go into heaven, there will be differences between us. There will be differences to those who have more rewards and those who do not. You're going to find some people who uh, grown up and matured in Christ. You're going to see those who didn't grow up and mature. You're going to see people that were like four chair, chair four people who were disciple makers. And you're going to see people who sat in chair two their whole life and never matured. But will we see that or only? We will see that in heaven. We will see who has more rewards and who doesn't. So I can expect when I go to heaven, I'm going to be looking at my reward to be like, yeah, I did pretty good. Then I'm going to look at Billy Graham and I'll be like, dang, that guy's got a lot of rewards. So it'll be obvious. It'll be obvious. Um, so is that like different tiers of heaven? What's that? Is that like there are different tiers of heaven? There are different, to a degree, there are different tiers. Uh, not everybody's in heaven. But some of us are going to sit there and go, wow, you are really an honored person because look at what you did in your life. And we're going to cheer them on and we'll get into the, is there going to be a feeling of regret in us? We'll get into that in a little bit. That's coming on up. But yeah, there's, it's not equal in heaven. Uh, there's definitely people of different levels of stature based on the life they've lived. Would it be just to have somebody who lived a terrible life, let's say the, um, oh, what was this, the son of Sam, the killer, who did become a follower of Christ at the end of, towards the end of his life and repented. Uh, and I think he was still executed, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. Would it be just if he got exactly the same rewards as Billy Graham? Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a great evangelist. You you just missed him. He died like right before you were born. He was a really great evangelist. But the says, would it be just for Sam, the uh, son of Sam, who was a killer, mass murderer? Well, he was a mass murderer. He's a uh, I don't know. He killed multiple people. Would it be just for him to get the same rewards as some of the best uh, preachers here on earth? Well, preachers. Oh. The Lord will forgive you as far as he needs this from the West. True. So I think that if he truly asked for forgiveness and he tried to live the remainder of his life as a Christian, I think he'll go to heaven. Yes. But will he be as high? In heaven, since you said there are kind of different years, as Billy Graham, no, no, yeah, you're right. There is different levels of what is what we will recognize as as we look at somebody's rewards. Some people are gonna have more rewards, and uh, I don't know how that affects position or what, but I do know that there is a judgment seat. So let's go ahead and look at this. First Corinthians, going back to this. Now, if any man builds upon a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. Again, what our life, he's, of course, there's a word pictures here, and he's trying to explain, obviously, it's not going to be gold, and silver, and precious gems, but it is what? What would, what would be things here that we'll get rewarded for? On earth? When we get into heaven, gold what are the things? Silver. Yeah, so what will those things be in real life? Good work. Okay, his works. What are those things? What bringing people to Christ. What's that? Bringing people to Christ. Bringing people to Christ would be really significant. Yes. Spreading the gospel. Yeah. Living Christian life. Obeying the commandments. Yep. 
reading your Bible, praying, all those things are the foundations. So those are the good things. What is what would be wood, hay, and straw? And you guys online, you guys can answer too as well. That'd be the fluff things in your life. Yeah. So what is fluff in our life? Uh, to be good, Wait, are we trying to be good? Trying to be good? I thought my mic turned off. I wasn't sure. sure. Go ahead, Amanda. Maybe. Did you remute yourself, Amanda? <laughs> you go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> we're we're being confused as to what the red means on the microphone. So. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about uh, things that that are rewarded. We were I had blurted out, but didn't realize we were muted. Was fasting, tithings, and um, prayer. Yes, that's good. Do you guys have one for wood, hay, and straw? I didn't hear that. What? Do you have anything for wood, hay, and straw? What would be wood, hay, and straw in our life? Um, the little things that we shouldn't concern ourselves uh, with. Would wood be would be for keeping you warm for fire and <laughs> hay. I would think to keep your animals warm in a barn. I don't know what else you would use hay for. Well, <laughs> like, That's because we would get to use that. <laughs> like in our life, these, mm -hmm. like I would look at wood and straw for the things that things that don't matter. So. Like, I, television show everybody loves Raymond I see every single episode recently came up at a, not recently came on a conversation actually a while ago and my wife and I said do you remember any of the episodes from everybody loves Raymond my wife couldn't remember them I couldn't remember them so I'm like did we waste a half hour every single night on something that doesn't really bring value to our no. life no and I have a question and we we talked about how much television do we want to put in our life not that television is bad, but I do I want to build up my life with a bunch of TV shows, which are wood, hay, and straw, that have no significant significance to it, or do I want to build up my life with gold, silver, and precious stones? And that this could be anything. This could be video games. This could be books. This could be anything that is just entertainment. Um, even mistreating people. Could be wood, hay, and straw, because those things will burn up. They don't. They don't have any real value. The Bible is a good book. Yes, you can read that one. Okay, here we go. For the day will show it, because it is revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So there's going to be a day when we stand before God, where all of what we have done will be tested before Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recomposed for his deeds and the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. No. Okay, Romans 14. For we all shall stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Each one of us is going to give an account to God. Now you may say, does that mean I could lose my salvation? We'll cover that in a second. Number two, the judgment will result in rewards or consequences, consequences which will take which will take into the millennial kingdom. The judgment will result in rewards or consequences which we will take into the millennial kingdom. So, will there be regrets for what we have not done? Yeah. yeah. And maybe even regrets for what we have done. Some people will say, no, that's not true. Because Scripture tells us in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 21, 4, that there is, I'm trying to think if I have that. I can hear me look. No, I don't have it. Uh, in the Revelation 4, 21, that there will be no tears in heaven. But the proper hermeneutics means that there's no tears in regards to death. That is talking about that there is no more death. 
And so therefore there won't be any tears. They'll all be wiped away because we're not going to have to experience or deal with death any longer. It does not mean that we won't have regrets, even in heaven. Look at see if I have anything else. On judgment day or will you always have regrets? I think it's going to stay with us. I mean, eventually we'll just learn how to live with it. But I think we'll always sit there and go, man, I just wish I, I wish I'd done that a little bit better. You know, I wish I'd done this. But as time moves on, I think you you just learn to live with it and just move on in life, just like we deal with our regrets today. Um, I'm sad, but I don't live in my regret all the time. When it comes to my mind, I go, oh yeah, I really shouldn't have laughed at that girl who stood up for Jesus in my class. That is something that I should not have done. But uh, I don't think about it all the time. It's just something that comes from time to time. I'll think about it. All right. So now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work if any man's work which has been built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. So there's going to be rewards for the choices we have made. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. And here's sort of the consequences. So yes, we are rewarded and we suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. Does not mean you lose your salvation. Okay? You can suffer loss without losing your salvation. Once saved, always saved is a very true statement. It continues to be true. Yet, so as through fire. Uh, Colossians. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men, knowing that for the Lord you will see the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, for he does wrong. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So God is not going to show favoritism to anyone. And that's good because that means God's not holding you more or less in regards to consequences and rewards. He is fair. Number three, there's a very real response, a possibility that Christians could stand before the judgment seat and have nothing to show for the life that they have lived. That's not the first No. No. So this is really where I thought I should have talked about regrets. This is where some people are going to get into heaven, and they're not going to have anything to show. They're going to get into heaven, again, smelling like smoke. But they're in heaven. Which is a whole lot better than hell. And I don't think they're going to regret that they're in heaven. No one's going to regret that. They might regret it if they're in hell, but not regret it if they're in heaven. But I think every person that goes to hell is going to end up regretting it. They may think they don't. Did you hear the, um, the whole like thing for hell? No. Talk about like when pastors say about how people they wake up from death and you know when they die and they come back and they when they die they went to heaven and they were all alone and they were like the loneliness just tortured them and they uh, came back alive. I do think I don't know if they come back alive, but I do think that there's very true response, true possibility that every individual who dies. Uh, not accepting this Christ will be alone because God does not want people hurting people. And so one of the best ways to protect people is to isolate them. But they will all face the punishment that they have chosen to receive. But again, it goes back to that. Uh, Bill and I are talking about when you sin against somebody in Jewish culture, uh, it was considered a debt. That person had a debt that they owed you. And so in our society, we saved on Will you forgive me? Because I'm asking you to forgive my debt because I owe you. And so that is, um, yeah. When we choose to not accept Jesus' payment for salvation, then we owe that debt to God. When you sin against a rock, your sin 
is only against a rock. So your debt is minimal to zero. When you sin against a person, you're sinning against a uh, finite person. So therefore, your debt that you owe that person is finite. When you sin against an eternal God, then your sin and the debt that you owe is eternal and infinite. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians. You can see this verse a lot tonight. It's almost like a memory verse by the time we're done. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which has been built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved yet as through fire. So here's a man who's went to heaven and his work and everything that he had has been burned up deep on a cross. It's likely a good case where his all of his work was burned up because he didn't have any work. I mean, he just got in at the, at the very end. But I'm happy I'll get to meet him someday. Number four, a major part of the judgment will concern the work we have done for the Lord, our accomplishments. A major part of the judgment will concern the work we have done for the Lord, our accomplishments. I do have a question. Yeah. If you're feeling guilt, isn't it like a bad feeling? Then you're not supposed to decide. Um, no, there's no. Uh, remember, again, there's no tear in heaven, is because. Um, because we're no longer having to deal with death. That's proper hermeneutics of scripture. But it does not mean that we won't have regrets for things that we did on here on earth. It means that we're gonna look back and be like, man, I just wish I was sinless and on earth. I wish I had taken more time to talk to God. So that's, you're in heaven, it is perfect as paradise, you're in God's presence, but it doesn't mean you can't have regrets. It doesn't mean you're always gonna live in them though. I mean, don't you have regrets that you, that you've done something stupid in the past? Okay. Do you think about them all day long? Every day? No. When we go to the beach, are you thinking about your regrets? Okay. When you're hanging out with family and we're having fun, are you thinking about your regrets? You won't think about your regrets all the time, but you will be reminded of them from time to time. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Paul planted the church. Apollos watered. He did the teaching. He was their first pastor. Uh, Paul was the church planter. Apollos was the pastor. But God was causing the growth. So that neither one of the ones who plants nor the one who waters. So these are both valuable. They're both needed. And, they're, and they accomplish much. Paul planted the church, but it was Apollos who discipled the church and grew the church over time. Is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Different jobs, but they're both doing accomplishments. But each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We are all God's workers. We all have a job, but our job is different for each of us. Mine is to equip the saints. That's my job. That's what I'm here for, to equip the saints, uh, for the work of the ministry. But each one you are to do as Disciple makers or evangelists, you each have a different way of approaching it and a different a skill set that you are to employ to make it happen. My job is just to equip you. I mean, I have more than that, but that's one of my jobs, my major job. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder. Whenever I see master builder, I because I have kids, I think of Legos. So um, if you're a master builder, that means you can build like amazing things. If you ever watch, if you don't know what I'm talking about, watch a Lego movie. It's actually kind of good. You think of Minecraft? I still think Legos. Anyways, yeah, I think Minecraft is basically just Legos on the on a computer. So we are supposed to be builders. I lay the foundation, and another is building upon it. Again, both builders. 
Even though he may, Paul may have only laid the foundation of the church, Apollos, without that foundation, Apollos had nothing to work with. So they're both working together, each using their own skill sets that they have that are different from each other. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. And now if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show, show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he is built upon, it remains, he shall receive a reward. So as you guys are seeing this verse over and over and over, do you see what, how all the different components, are you starting to see the different components of this verse? And we'll keep building on that. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as through fire. Okay, John 15, eight, ooh, a new verse. Uh, by this, my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Again, you want to prove that you're, much, that you're one of God's disciples, then you need to want to bear much fruit. Number five, we are able to accomplish work for the Lord because God supplies opportunities, opens doors for us. We're able to accomplish work for the Lord because God supplies opportunities, open doors for us. If you want to, I should have touched on this on the previous one. If you want a good job in heaven, because we are talking about that a little bit earlier. If you want a good job in heaven, you want one of the, like, the primo jobs, then use the skill sets that God has given you. Either your, uh, your talents or your spiritual gifts uh, for God. And that is how you get the good job in heaven. Uh, there are people, we were, to, Abigail, you, you, I just remembered something else. Uh, when Jesus is talking to, not Jesus, Jesus tells a parable about a, a man who gives each of his servants a, a talents. He gives one guy 100 talents, he gives the next guy 10 talents, and he gives the last guy like five talents. And the guy who's got like 100 talents, he goes in and invests it. The guy's got 10 so talents. He goes out and invests it. The guy who got like five talents, he goes out and buries it. And when Jesus, or when the master returns, which is in this case an indication of God, when the master returns, he goes to the first two and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful a little, now I'll put you in charge of many things. And he says that to the first two. When he gets to the last one, he says, you wicked, lazy servant. Yes, but here's the thing. That servant called the master his master. He was a servant of the master. That master even refers to him as a servant. Just like in, in our lives, there's going to be many who are going to call Jesus Lord, and he's going to be like, you wicked, wicked, lazy disciple. Because it doesn't mean he lost his salvation, but it does mean that there will be regrets. So look for opportunities, and many gifts will come with it. Uh, if, this, if salvation is free, why are there so many verses on work? You don't work to get in heaven. You don't work to get in heaven. Now you don't do. If salvation is free, why are there so many? Yes. See, that's where it comes out. There's so many verses about works, not because we are earning our way into heaven. That always needs to, we always need to separate those two. Salvation is earned or given to us by the grace of God. Our rewards are based on our works. And I always want to make sure I bring that up over and over and over because I know most of the time we always think that they go together. And we're always struggling trying to figure out, well, wait a second, how does, I thought I got salvation through grace, but yet there's these works. How does that work? Well, it's because he's actually talking about two different things. 
and we have to put them together. Salvation and works and treasures are separate. Um, and you can't get to heaven by works alone. You can't get into heaven by works at all. Works will never get you into heaven. You can only get into hell, heaven from salvation. You can only uh, grace and faith in Christ. You can only get your rewards, though, from their works. So there's two different things that I've talked about. But yeah, you're basically right on. All right. First Corinthians. Wow. So surprised. I didn't expect that verse. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave. Opportunity to each one. Both were given opportunities. I planted Apollos water, but God was causing. This is important to God. It's the Holy Spirit that causes the growth. I do not grow people in this church. My, my messages on Sunday are not so amazing that you guys are growing. That is actually coming from the Holy Spirit. But I'm doing the work I'm supposed to do. So the neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. So do, are, are you dependent upon making people grow spiritually? Am I responsible for your own spiritual no. growth? No. No. I'm, no. I'm responsible for equipping you and teaching you and preparing you and talking about this. Yeah, but as far as the, as the growth goes, ultimately that falls on, on you guys. And you have the opportunities to grow. Number six, we will have success at the work that we attempt to do for the Lord because of the strength and grace and blessings that he gives. We will have success at the work that we attempt to, to do for the Lord because of the strength and the grace and blessings that he gives. Will your life go according to plan? No. Does it mean that nothing that you do goes according to plan that you fail? I'll say it again. Does it mean if nothing goes to the plan according to your plan that you had for your life, does it mean you failed? No. God is choosing how things are going to happen, but it does not mean Paul had certain plans. It didn't work out the way he had hoped. Over and over, he could say, I thought I was going to be able to come visit you. That didn't work out. Doesn't mean he failed. He, he trusted God and God, and he found his success in Christ, and his blessings came from God. Let me pull up this verse right here. First Corinthians again. According to the grace of God given to me. Everything that is given to us is from the grace of God and is given to us as a wise master builder. I laid a foundation. Colossians. And we will proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So when God, God wants you to accomplish the goals in your life. God wants you to be successful. Going back to lesson number two, uh, lesson number two, number 17. Let me pull this up real quick. Let me see if you remember this. Next page, actually fine. Your life, in order to be successful, success is accomplishing the goals that God has led us to set for his glory and our growth. That is success. Now, what we think is not money, it's not power, but it is fulfilling the goals that God has set for us in our glory and for our growth, well, for his glory and our growth. And that, number seven, we will be unable to accomplish anything for the Lord unless we proactively choose to do something.
So who are we to focus on? God. Okay, we we'll focus on God, and we're to focus on moving to spiritual maturity from going from chair two to chair three to chair four. Here's what's interesting. Chair three is the beginning of serving. It's when you start to serve people and you enjoy it, but it doesn't mean you're a disciple maker yet. Chair, chair four is when you're primarily thinking about other people now, how to mature them. That's when you know when you moved into chair four. As a pastor, I stayed in chair three for a long time before I moved to chair four. All right, number eight. Oh, I planted Paulo's water. We are God's fellow workers. I lay the foundation, and another is building upon it. Number eight, a major aspect of the work we do for the Lord will be what we do for his bride, the church. God is going to reward us when we serve the church. A major aspect of the work we do for the Lord will be what we do for his bride, the church. Love each other as I have loved you. Jesus gave that commandment. He gave that commandment to the disciples. He did not tell the disciples to make sure that they love the whole world. He said to love each other as I have loved you. So the disciples to take care of each other first. That is a prop, top priority. Because as a church is loving each other and taking care of each other, in a very dark world with people seeing other people genuinely caring about other people, genuinely saying, hey, you want to come over for lunch? Like the people that you they wouldn't normally invite over for lunch. Hey, you want to get together? The people that they don't normally get together, just church people. When they start doing that and start caring for the church, the rest of the world takes notice. What do you mean? That person's not in that other person's social class. What are they doing together? Like they're friends. That is unheard of in our world. We have social classes here in the United States. Churches often have social classes too. So when the church starts to ignore the social classes and start caring for the people outside of their social class, that blows the mind of the world around us. And that's when they become interested and want to join the church. They want to find out about this Christ. Why are people living differently? What then is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered. And God was causing the growth so that neither one of the neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. So here Paul is taking care, he planted the church. He's taking care of the bride of Christ. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. You are God's field and God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. What is he building upon? The foundation. And what's the foundation? Does anybody remember what the foundation is? Jesus, Jesus Christ. What? Yes, Jesus is the foundation, and we are building upon it, on his gospel. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. Now if any man then builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will, be sh will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which is... He has built upon remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as through fire. Uh, Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands are to do what? Love their wives. And how is he supposed to treat her? Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do for the church? Christ did something specific for the church, for you and I. He forgave us. Well, how did he forgive us? What did he do to forgive us? He died. Husbands are to love their wives. They are to give up their life for their wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. Christ sacrificed. Yeah, husbands are to. 
the husbands are to sacrifice for their wife just as Christ suffered and sacrificed for so the wait, church. So wives don't we, have to do that? No, that's not a call. You're just called to submit. Totally different one. But it's a lot easier to submit to somebody when they're willing to sacrifice themselves so, to you. So if I'm going to die, I kind of want them to die for me. Moving on. Okay, Matthew 16, 18. Ew. And I also say to you that you, that's why you're never getting married, uh, <laughs> that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. So again, uh, Jesus is building on this rock, which was the declaration that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. That's the rock that they're building on. It's on the gospel. Number nine, a major bear. The major barriers of bearing much fruit for God is fear of failing, laziness, lukewarmness, selfishness, and worldliness. The major barriers to bearing much fruit for God is fear of failing, laziness, lukewarmness, selfishness, and worldliness. I won't get into the why since I'll keep us moving tonight. Good. Normally I'd ask you why this is the truth. But I won't ask, I'll only ask that Colin write a five page paper on this within the next day. Thanks, Colin. Do you no, agree? Don't, if you don't, object, say something quick. Don't, you didn't object. Okay, good. So, uh, don't skip it. Unless, oh, you still write it? Go ahead. No, Worldliness, it's world. Yes. Okay, I'm moving on. No, Abby, Abby, Abby. Okay, moving on. Matthew 25, 25 to 30. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See you what see you have what is yours? But his master answered him and said to him, You Wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. This is not a verse in regards to salvation. This is a verse talking about rewards. When I would read this and I saw this about talking about, and I was thinking they were talking about salvation, this used to really confuse me until I learned to separate the two. I went, oh, they're talking about two different subjects. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who is who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, who has, to everyone who has shall more be given, and he shall have an abundance. But for the one who does not, even what he does have shall be taken away. And that is where we move to the loss of rewards. Because he was lazy. He was. He was afraid of failing. So he didn't do anything. Wait, you're on the woman. Yeah. He was lazy. He was lukewarm. I used to call it mukewarm. Because I messed up one time. And I called it mukewarm. And I just thought, you know, that kind of describes it better. Because can you imagine, you know, muke, like mucus? Imagine a uh, room temperature mucus being in your mouth. Like when you're sick, you know when you're sick and you got all that phlegm mucus in your mouth? What do you want to do? Spit it out. Spit it out. I swallowed it. So when you think of lukewarmness, now change that to an M and you got mukewarmness. Now you got a really good picture of why it's nasty. So Jesus doesn't even want mukewarmness in his mouth. He's going to spit you out, then you'd be mukewarm. We are selfish and we follow the world worldliness. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Actually, I cover that one. Um, okay, and cast out the worthless slave into the outer darkness in the place that there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there is some form of punishment. I don't know how exactly what it is. No, he's not going to hell. But there is a punishment for a life that is focused on self, especially when one knows. It's I think that when I look at the thief on the cross, he probably got more grace because he accepted Christ. He figured it out at the end. Uh, but one who's been a Christian for a long time and who should know better, I think they're going to be the ones who are going to be facing the biggest consequences. Man. And they're going to be like, what? Why am I facing so much consequences? Because they knew better. 
So the person who's been in this church for 50 years of their life and has been lukewarm at all time, that's the one who's going to be facing a consequence. The, what I appreciate about like with you guys in here is that uh, is that you guys are making a strong effort, and God is going to recognize that. But I know people who who I've invited to this class who are choosing to be mute warm, and that concerns me. Okay, Abby, you need to stop. You're down to like one comment left. That's it. The last one. That's serious. Ten, wise people will always make decisions in life with one eye on the judgment day. Wise people, you, you want to be wise? Keep your eye on the judgment day. Wise people always make decisions in, in this life with one eye on judgment day. It's what motivates us to make the right choices. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? I love the story. And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build them larger ones. And there will be store all my grain and all my goods. Ah, anyway. And I will say to my, my soul, soul, you have many good laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So it is a man who lays up his treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So lay up your treasures in heaven, not in our earth, which will burn up. I mean, you guys have a lot of toys here on earth, but guess what? When you die, where are all your toys going? Can't take them with you. Somebody else gets to enjoy them. Well, you know what? I got a bunch of tools when I was younger because my grandpa died. All the things that he had saved up for and put away and invested in all these tools, they didn't get to enjoy them. I enjoyed them. So there are things that will happen. Um, but I won't get into it. Number 11. As we work harder for the Lord, many other people will be blessed and be in eternity and the kingdom because of what we have done. This is significant. As we work hard for the Lord, many other people will be blessed and be in eternity and the kingdom because of what we have done. Oh, I can't barely see. Three different times Paul says, you are my glory. That's how he refers to the church. You are my glory. They are his reward. Because he knows that when he goes to heaven, he's going to see these people in heaven. And that's going to be a reward. He'll be rewarded for them there. He's going to be rewarded because he's going to be able to see them. Many people are going to be like, hey, Paul, we're here because of what you did. Because of how hard you worked. And it's blessed me. So that is his testimony when he enters into heaven. Paul doesn't have to give a testimony about himself. He has hundreds of people in heaven because of what he did. What then is Paul's? And what is Paul? Servants who through whom you believed. First Thessalonians 4. Who is our hope? Our joy, our crown of exaltation. It is not even, it is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus as he is coming. For you are glory and joy. Number 12. If our work is burned up at the judgment day of Christ, we will still be saved and live in the new heaven forever because we are saved by faith alone. That's the biggest thing right there. We are saved by faith alone. If all work is burned up in the judgment seat of the day of Christ, we will be still be saved and live in the new heaven forever because we are saved by faith alone. Our purpose 
it's not purpose statement. Our mission statement for our church is lead people to the Father, disciple them in Christ, and send them out with the Holy Spirit. Our desire is that everybody will enter into the kingdom of heaven forever. And of course, I want them to come in with rewards. That should motivate us, especially the more mature we are. But I, my biggest goal is to see everybody come to know Christ. So that's number one, lead people to the Father. I want to see them get into heaven. Our next one is to build them up, or like bring, them, um, bring them to the Father, build them up in Christ, or disciple them in Christ. We want to grow and mature people so that they will eventually become spiritual parents, and then they will send them out with the Holy Spirit and leading people to Christ. All right, let's close up in prayer. What's the new heaven? What's that? Is there a new heaven? Is there an old heaven? Yes, there actually is. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit this really super fast. There's the old heaven. The old heaven is, is the current heaven right now. So heaven is wherever God is present. Wherever God is residing, that is heaven. So there's... Yes. Yes, you are absolutely right. So right now, um, okay. So let's go back to Adam and Eve. You have you have Adam and Eve down here, and you have the kingdom of heaven, and they were together in the Garden of Eden. And so they were together. So God's throne would be right there in the Garden of Eden. He was living with Adam and Eve. Then Adam and Eve sinned, and it tore the two worlds apart. And sin now separated the two. So. God's got this heaven here. That's where he's living now. That's the old heaven. And this is the old earth. There's going to be a time when the, our earth here is going to be completely wiped out. And he's going to build a new earth and create a new heaven and put the two back together like the Garden of Eden. I don't know how God would do stars and planets. I don't know. But you know what? He did it the first time with stars and earth and planets. I imagine the second time. He'll do the same thing, but it's going to be like Hawaii on steroids. I've decided. I have spoken. So, if you get what that's from, if you don't get what that's from, don't worry. But you should worry because it's called the Mandalorian TV show. You need to watch it. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll close up in prayer.